For 2019, the rules around the minimum allowed weight are changing slightly. This year, the total weight of the car and driver together will have to weigh at least 733 kilograms, excluding fuel. Next year, the driver and their seat must meet a minimum weight of their own. It's expected this will be 80 kilograms. The rest of the car, excluding the fuel, will have to make up the remaining 653 kilograms. A minimum weight is partly enforced for reasons of safety, to ensure teams don't skimp on their car's strength in pursuit of speed. Every kilogram of mass you have requires more energy to accelerate it around a track, as you'd know if you've ever had to run while carrying massive bags. By the way, weight and mass do mean different things, but I'll be using them in fairly interchangeably throughout this video, as it doesn't really matter in this context. If you do want to know the specific differences, I'll explain that over the credits. Okay, so we now have to weigh the driver and seat separately to the rest of the car. In what way is this different to weighing the car and driver as one mass? A smaller 65kg driver and a larger 75kg driver will weigh identically when combined with their cars. So why is it so much easier to have a smaller driver in your car that drivers have been known to lose unhealthy amounts of weight to benefit performance? And the answer is weight distribution. See, cars are built as underweight as possible and then brought up to the minimum weight via ballast. Ballast is the term given to heavy material strategically placed around the cars for stability. Ships and aeroplanes also use ballast. Often heavy metals like tungsten are used for this purpose. As they are so dense, very heavy masses can be placed precisely without taking up room. So how does weight distribution affect an F1 car? Well, there are a number of factors at play here. One is how much you want to load up the tyres. See, the tyres are the only points of the car that touch the ground, so ultimately all the weight of the car is borne through the tyres. If you force a tyre to bear too much weight, it can start to overheat more quickly as it's used, which can lead to degradation and loss of grip. If a tyre has too little weight pushing it into the ground, then it is more prone to slip and can more easily lock under braking. Pirelli, of course, designed front and rear tyres with certain expected weight demand thresholds. And in fact, the rules mandate that during qualifying, when the car is low fueled, the weight applied on the front and rear wheels must not be less than 333 and 393 kilograms, respectively, during qualifying. Secondly, we have to consider acceleration. All the acceleration comes from the rear wheels, as these are the driving wheels. More weight over the rear axle, to a point, leads to better traction through and out of the corners, meaning better acceleration. Underbalance the rear of the car, and traction will suffer. And what else happens when we move ballast around between front and rear of the car? Well, we need to have a little understanding of two things. Moments and inertia. A moment is a turning force. Specifically, when we think about moments, we think of a pivot point and applying a force a certain distance from that point. Imagine a door. It shouldn't be too hard, there's probably one right behind you. If you apply a force, i.e. push against the door close to the hinge, it's much harder to get the door to turn than if you apply the same force further from the hinge. Just FYI, the actual definition of a moment is the force you apply multiplied by the distance from the pivot that you apply it. So on a seesaw, you can place a 1 kilogram weight 2 metres from the pivot, and a 2 kilogram weight 1 metre from the pivot, and it would all balance out. So with that in mind, think what would happen if we placed a 100 kilogram weight right at the end of the seesaw, let's say 3 metres out. It would be really hard to get the seesaw moving, right? But if we move that mass more towards the centre, suddenly it becomes a whole lot easier, doesn't it? And that's the first lesson. It's hard to turn something whose weight is far from the pivot point. You could try this um, carefully. Hold a hammer from the end of the stick part and start to swing it about carefully. It's much harder work than holding it from the hammer end because this time all the weight is much closer to the turning point. So back to the F1 car, because of its layout, you're turning it around a point somewhere between all the wheels, roughly in the centre. Don't want the centre of mass to be too far from the turning point or it will require more energy to get the car turning quickly and it won't be particularly nimble. Now let's consider inertia, but quickly first let's define the centre of mass, which you'll often hear as the centre of weight, though that's less accurate. It's very simple, the centre of mass is the average point of all the mass in an object. A pretty regular homogeneous cuboid of plastic would have a centre of mass bang in the middle. But if that block was half plastic, half lead, then the centre of mass would be way towards the lead end of the block, as the lead part has more mass, it's more dense. Therefore, on average, the mass of the block would be much more towards the lead end, away from the centre. And that's what centre of mass means. It's also the balance point of the object. If you place the plastic lead block on its centre of mass, it would balance perfectly, even though you can see it's not placed bang in the middle. With our F1 car, if we start moving the centre of mass around by repositioning the ballast, we'll see the weight load on each tyre change accordingly. So inertia then, like I said. Inertia is the resistance of an object to change 
in velocity. If a car is travelling along, it doesn't actually want to be moved around, it doesn't want to change direction or speed, it wants to keep going and going as it is until you put some force in to make it do something else, like braking or steering or accelerating or crashing into a barrier. The more mass something has, the more resistant it is to change. A double-decker bus driving at 60 miles an hour is harder to stop than a Mini Cooper going at the same speed. So bearing inertia in mind that bodies of mass will tend to keep going and resist being yanked about, let's take a look at a car cornering but with all its weight shoved at the rear end of the car. That car is going straight and then it turns right, but all the weight wants to keep going straight so as the front steers in the back really wants to keep going and this leads to the back sliding out, which we'll call oversteer. On the flip side, if we bunged all the weight at the front, all the weight at the front would want to carry on. The front is now resistant to being turned in and struggles to get the car steering as much as we'd like. This is called understeer. And finally, now we've looked at front to rear distribution, let's look at top to bottom weight distribution. See, ballast tends to be placed as low as possible to lower the overall centre of mass. But why is this useful? Well, let's consider inertia again, particularly if the centre of mass is quite high up. The car will turn in, but all this mass will resist being turned in. So the top of the car will be the most sluggish to respond and lean out as the bottom of the car moves in. This is car roll, when the car rotates along its centre line. The problem with the car rolling too much is it starts to unbalance the tyre loads. The inside tyres start to lift and the outside tyres take all the weight. Body roll is heavily controlled by suspension engineering, but that's definitely for another video. So bringing the overall weight down as low to the ground as possible is a great help at reducing body roll and keeping the car balanced through the corners. Which brings us back to the driver. See a taller, heavier driver will naturally be carrying their weight quite high up compared to a lighter driver with low ballast around them. Enforcing the driver's seat weight to meet a strict minimum means a lighter driver loses a lot of the advantage of having a lot more ballast to be strategic with. The obvious, fairest place to put the mandated seat ballast to bring the weight up to 80 kilograms is not down on the floor but halfway up the seat roughly where the actual driver's centre of mass is. I hope the FIA mandate a minimum height for seat ballast. So I hope this helps you understand why the new rules are finally separating the minimum weights of the driver and the car. Any questions leave them in the comments. Thank you very much for my Patreon patrons for supporting me with these videos. And now, as promised, what's the difference between weight and mass? Well, mass is the amount of stuff in an object, i.e. a human adult is made of, let's say, 70 kilograms of stuff. Weight is the measure of how much that stuff pushes down towards the ground. Now, for the most part, in everyday life, these things are pretty similar. A 70 kilogram person pushes down with the weight that 70 kilograms of anything would, right? Except if they're going up in a lift, in which case they'd push down harder. Or they're going down in a lift and they'd push down less. On the moon, they weigh less. In space, they weigh basically nothing, but their mass will always stay the same. See, once you start doing things with a mass, the weight can change quite a lot, which is why they are technically different things, but you don't have to think about that when following a recipe. Unless you're a chef on the moon.